the seventh chapter of Kutubot, which, by the way, is the central chapter in the tractate. It's the central chapter in the Masachet. Deals with questions of behavior within marriage, in particular, and in particular, what kinds of behavior can end a marriage, can result in the husband being forced to divorce the wife, or the wife being um, under the penalty of being divorced without her kutubah. That's the seventh chapter. As we move into the eighth chapter, and we're going to move into the eighth chapter today. We get back to questions of finance, of money, as most of the tractate, in fact, has dealt with. And maybe this is a, a result of the fact that marriage in the time of the Mishnah was in large part an economic, an, you know, an economic transaction. And when we learn the Mishnah of Kiddushin, we'll see, in fact, the tension between marriage as an emotional transaction and a marriage as an economic transaction. The Mishnah seems to recognize both sides. But here in the eighth chapter of Ketubot, we're very much into economics. So we're going to explore how these economics change as a woman progresses from being completely free and unattached to being betrothed. In other words, Mukudeshet in Hebrew, effectively separated, locked up, dedicated to being completely married. So those are the three states. And as she passes through these three states, her husband has ever increasing economic rights to her property. Because the wife's property in the marriage, in the time of the Mishnah, is shared. Not so much shared 50-50, but shared in the sense that she owns the principal and he owns the income. In other words, she's entitled to the principal. If she leaves the marriage because of divorce or because of the death of her husband, she takes the property. So the property remains hers. But during the course of the marriage, until she leaves it, the income is his. Because he has to support her in terms of her clothes, her food, her maintenance. And there seems to be an assumption in the Mishnah that this transaction, that, that if you like, there's quid pro quo, that there's some kind of reciprocity by the between the fact that he has to support her and pay for her goods and services, and she, her income therefore reverts to him. So those are the concepts that we need just to understand these Mishnayot which follow. So let's jump in at the beginning of the eighth chapter. A woman came into possessions before she was betrothed. She's a, she's a completely single woman. She has some possessions. She gets some possessions. Maybe she inherits them. Maybe she owns them. Maybe she's given them. Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel agree. She can sell it. She can give it. Her act is valid. She has complete control over those possessions. Let's keep moving. Naflula mi shenit arsa. So she comes into possession after she's betrothed. So she's now in this middle state between be be being completely free and completely married. And now we'll have a dispute between Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai. Beit Shammai omrim, Timkor, Beit Shammai says she can sell it. Uveid Hillel Omrim, not in core. Beit Hillel says she can't sell it. Really interesting that Beit Shammai here stand up for the property rights of the woman. And in general, we're going to see through the rest of the Mishnah, we've already seen, by the way, that Beit Shammai very often do stand up for property rights. So they're doing that here. So Beit Shammai says she can sell it. She's a free woman. Beit Hillel says, no, she cannot sell it. But the Eilu, Eilu, the Eilu Modin, they both agree. If she had sold it or given it away, her act is valid. So she can't, she, maybe she may not sell it, according to Beit Hillel, but if she does, the act is valid. And Rabbi Yuda is going to bring an alternative opinion that was argued a generation before Rabbi Yuda. In front of Rabban Gamliel, this is Rabban Gamliel of Yavne. Amar Rabbi Yudah, 
אמרו לפני רבן גמליה, רבי יוג'ודו סד, they argued before רבן גמליה. הואיל וזכה באישה לא זכה בי נכס, בנכסים, since the man has kind of acquired the woman, doesn't he acquire her property? In other words, she's become engaged, she's become betrothed, doesn't he have some right over this property? And Rav Angamliel is going to push back. Amar lahem, v'chadashim anu boshim, we are embarrassed about her new possessions. What is he saying? He's saying, we know the halacha is that possessions that accumulate her during the marriage come in some way under the, the economic domain of the husband. But we're embarrassed by this. Really, really interesting insight. First of all, into the, if you like, the fact that Rama Gamliel understands the non-gender neutrality of this halacha. He seems to have accepts it as one that's received from his ancestors, maybe from previous generations. I mean, we assume most of these halachot come from Bavel, two, three hundred years before the time of Rabban Gamliel. Rabban Gamliel seems to understand that this is a custom and practice in Israel, and he cannot change it. Having said that, even though he can't change it, he's not going to extend it. It works during marriage. He's not going to extend it to work during betrothal. He's not going to extend it to work before marriage. He's going to hold the line. Let's keep going. Naflula mi shenisait. She comes into possession after she gets married. Right? This is the third example. She get, comes into possession after she gets married. Naflula mi shenisait. If she comes into possession after she's married, both Beit Hila and Beit Shammai agree that if she sells it or gives it away, the husband can seize it back from the buyers, i.e. she has no right to dispose of that property during her marriage. If she acquires the property during the marriage, she needs permission from her husband to dispose of it. Because while the principal belongs to her, the income belongs to her husband. So she, he, he has an interest. She can't just get rid of it. Everybody agrees. And so these are the three stages. Before betrothal, during betrothal, but before marriage, and after marriage. And now, at the end, the, the Mishnah does a little bit of a recap. Whether this is a textual error, I'm not sure. I mean, this, this text is in our manuscript, the Kaufman manuscript, and, and it's in all of the, it's in the printed editions too. But let, let's look. Let's look. Ad shaloni seit veni seit. Before she married, and then she got married. So it sounds like she's acquired the property before she got married whether before she's betrothed or before after, we're not sure, but definitely before she's married. She's held on to it, but now during the marriage, she wants to get rid of it. So she acquires it before the marriage, but she wants to dispose of it after the marriage. This is property she's brought into the marriage. Ad shaloni seit veni seit. Property she's brought into the marriage, she wants to get rid of it after she gets married. Rabban Gamliel Omer, Imachra Venatna Kayam. Before she got married and then she married, Ram Gamliel says if she sold it or gave it away, her act is legally valid. So Rabban Gamliel is holding on to his line, really, that we're not going to extend these rights that a husband has to properly acquire during the marriage. We're not going to extend them back. And Rabbi Chaniyah ben Akavya is going to object. Amar Rabbi Chaniyah ben Akavya, Amru lifnei Rabbi Gamliel, Hoyo v'zachava isha lo zachav v'nechassim. Rabbi Chaniyah ben Akavya said, they argued before Rabbi Gamliel, since the man acquires the woman, doesn't he also acquire her property? So she had the property before she got married, doesn't he get the property? And Rabbi Gamliel again will push back. Amar lahem, 
But we are embarrassed with regard to her new possessions. We don't, we don't like the halacha that property she acquires during the marriage is, um, if you like, tied up, except with her husband's consent. We don't like the halacha. We're embarrassed with regard to her new possessions. Do you want to roll over on us, the old ones as well? Rabban Gamliel is not going to allow the halacha to be extended. Now, this is really interesting. In the second Mishnah, Rabbi Shimon is going to try to make a different kind of distinction. So until now, we've been looking at property acquired before betrothal, during betrothal, perhaps before marriage, we're not sure when, and after the marriage. So we're, we're going through a time, if you like, we're going down the time axis. And Rabbi Shimon is going to give us a completely different axis. He's going to give us the knowledge axis. But we are presuming, we're presuming this is all property acquired before the marriage. And he's going to give the he's going to give the husband some property rights. In other words, he's pushing back on Rabbi Gamliel, but in a different way. Rabbi Shimon Cholek. Rabbi Shimon makes a distinction. Well, Cholek can mean make a distinction, but it can also mean to argue with. So he argues with perhaps the opinion in the previous Mishnah, or he makes a distinction. Bein nechasim minechasim. He distinguishes between one kind of property and another. Property that's known to the husband, she may not sell. This is a property acquired before the marriage and seemingly before the betrothal. So the first Mishnah said she can sell it. And Rabbi Shimon is saying, hang on just a sec. Perhaps, perhaps, the husband has a, 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 and this is a, we find this idea difficult today, although we can understand it. Perhaps the husband is going to say, no, 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 no. I offered you my, I offered to marry you because I knew you owned that field over there. And I wanted to develop it or I wanted to, you know, it's maybe it's next to my field. You know, I, I'm actually marrying you for an economic reason. And economics is important. In the Mishnah and in well, in many societies as part of marriage. I married you because of that property. And Hasim Hayyaduim La Baal Lo Timkor. Property that's known to the husband, she can't sell. And if she had sold it or given it away, her act is void. In other words, once she's once she's agreed to marry him, property that was known to him at the time of the agreement, well, it can't be disposed of. Property that's unknown to the husband. Lotim Property that's unknown to the husband. Well, she shouldn't really sell. The kayam. But if she does decide to sell it, her act is valid. The husband can't go back to the buyers and dissolve the sale. 